Boy, I am tired today. I had an infusion on Friday, and uh, I'm going to sleep hard tonight, I'll tell you. Well, the room looks a little different, doesn't it? Just a little bit. Uh, keep you on your toes today. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. So we're going to pretend that this is Thursday night, the night before Jesus goes to the cross, a Thursday night before he goes to the cross. So if you're in John chapter 13, we're going to be in two different spots today. So you're, I'm going to make you do work today. John chapter 13 and Mark chapter 14, okay? So kind of put your, if you have a, an actual Bible, it's nice for you today because you get to put your finger in there instead of having to find on your smartphone. I did that for you, old school Bible people. <clears throat> While the other ones are trying to, I just didn't have a phone. Yeah, so it helps sometimes to be old school. Right, Mike? <laughs> It helps to be old school sometimes, absolutely. So we're going to be in John first and setting this up for, for our Monday Thursday was what this was called. And we are in the Upside Down Kingdom, week two. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. Now I know what you're saying. Now pastor, didn't you go over this last week? Absolutely I did. But there were some things in there that we left out, so... That's where we're going to be. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him full authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God soon. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around his waist. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, he said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. And Jesus said to him, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, well, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who is bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sent, sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I'm not saying these things to you, things uh, to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. This fulfills the scripture that says, The one who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Now, Jesus was deeply troubled. Verse 21, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering, whom could he mean? The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the, at the table, which is John. We all know. I love how John puts that in there, the di disciple that Jesus loved. And he writes it so that nobody else can say, hey, I was the disciple Jesus loved. The disciples Jesus loved looked at each other. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter had mentioned to ask him, "Who is he talking about?" So that disciple leaned over to Jesus, that's John, and asked, "Lord, who is it?" 
Jesus responded, It is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, Hurry up and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give the money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. Now let's go over to Mark chapter 14. Just flip over. Mark chapter 14, verse 22. Verse 22, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. They sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for John and for Mark who are writing these, these words for us so that we could have a recording of what happened that night with your disciples. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So... Mark chapter 14, Matthew chapter um, 26, Luke chapter 22, and then John that we read today, and, and, and Mark also writes and records what happened that night around the table. John tells us a lot of what was said that night, and then we'll read over that for the next couple of weeks. We're going to see what Jesus actually said at the, the table that night. Some of the most important words that Jesus said were the last things that he said to his disciples that night. John doesn't tell us everything that happened, but he kind of pieces it together. Uh, I read a book uh, uh, about five years ago called The Last uh, 24 Hours That Changed the World. It's an incredible book that, that talks about everything that happened that night, everything that happened literally as it happened, uh, the last hours of Jesus' life. So it's, let's imagine that it's sunset on Thursday evening. The di disciples and Jesus have spent all day on the Mount of Olives, except for Peter and John, who went into town to prepare the Passover Seder. Um, Thursday, sunset, Thursday evening would be begin the Passover for the Jews. And it was the custom of the day to take your shoes off when you entered into the house. You would leave them at the door. Uh, your feet would be dirty from walking the dusty, sandy roads. And if there wasn't a servant available at the door, you would wash your own feet when you came in. We talked a little bit about this last week that you would wash your own feet at the door that night. And the problem is, there was no servant there. I think Jesus had asked the servant to take the night off just to see what his disciples would do. If there was no servant there, there would be a basin and a pitcher that would be left for you to wash your own feet. The disciples, as they're walking in, no doubt saw the basin and the bowl there. They saw all that there, but when they walked in that night, they said, well, I don't think I'm going to wash my feet because if I wash my feet, then i got to wash the feet of the guy who comes behind me. And they weren't going to do that. So they looked at the pitcher, they looked at the bowl, they passed it by and came and sat down around the table. This room, it was called the guest room or the upper room. It was owned by a wealthy individual. Uh, the room was located on the west side of Jerusalem uh, north, north of the temple, in the northern part of the city of David, called the upstairs room, or the, uh, the, the guest room, or the, we know it as the upper room. It was a requirement that, that at the Passover meal, you have it inside Jerusalem city limits, that you had to. The table would be kind of set up like this. Uh, you think, well, that's kind of a short table. Were the disciples all short? No, they were not all short. The disciples would have sat around a table like this because there would be pillows all around the edge of the table that would sit up kind of high. And what you would do is you would lean on your left side and you would dip into the food with your right hand. You would, your feet would be kind of laying out. I mean, how cool is that to eat laying down, right? You just take a nap. You get too much to eat like a Thanksgiving dinner. Man, you're, just, you're right there ready to, ready to take a nap. You're, you're good to go. 
Now, we have to go back to, into the first century to understand what this would have looked like. Low to the ground table, a reclining table called a triclinium, or tri because of three. Cushions on the floor, you sit with your feet behind you. And you can realize the stories that Jesus was, he was sitting around a table and, and he would have the conversation two times with ladies that would come and anoint his feet and wash his feet and the one that let her hair down and dried his feet with her tears. And you could see how Jesus, would be, the, the ladies would be able to do that. He could look at them and then turn around and have a conversation with everybody else at the table because his feet would be laying out and he would be facing towards the middle of the table. We see that in several gospel stories. It was a U-shaped table to allow the servants to serve in the middle of the table. And this was the single holiest meal that, the, that a Jewish person would ever eat. It was not eaten in a church or in a synagogue, but it was eaten at a home of someone. It tells the story of deliverance from Israel, from slavery. That story would, it was told year after year. That, that The tor- story was told about how that they were slaves in Egypt. And Jesus, and how God had delivered them from Egypt. And Jesus chose, intentionally chose, this time, this meal, for his last supper with his disciples. So Jesus comes to the room that night, to this, this last supper, this last meal, ever, on earth. Knowing that within a few hours, he would be arrested, taken to a trial before the Sanhedrin. And after sunrise the next morning, he would be tried by Pontius Pilate. He would be tortured, beaten by the Roman soldiers, hung on a cross, and by 9 a.m. the next morning, and that he would die in six hours later. And they would, he would be laid in a borrowed tomb. This was it. This was the last time that he would get to be with his disciples. Now, the best way to know what's happening that night at the dinner table is to look at Exodus the, the first 15 chapters of Exodus. It tells the story of what happens in Egypt with, these, with the children of Israel. They were enslaved in Egypt about 1,300 years before Christ. The Egyptians were forcing the Israelites to not only build for them, but they had to make the bricks to build with. They, the Egyptians didn't offer that, the, the materials for them to do their job. How many of you have that at your job where you are asked to do things without giving much material? It got to a point uh, where Pharaoh had them doing all these building projects for him. And they had to make more and more bricks with less and less material. And so eventually the people of Israel cried out to God for a deliverer. And God sent Moses. Moses comes and confronts Pharaoh. And he told him that the God of the universe tells you to let his people go. And Pharaoh laughs in Moses' face. Moses tell him, tells him, well, if you're not going to let them go, that there are plagues coming on your people, and you're going to want to let them go. Nine plagues later, and they still are not free. So God tells Moses to tell the people of Israel to pack up everything. They're leaving tonight. I mean, that's crazy, right? Pharaoh has not told them that they could go yet. They're still slaves. So God tells Moses to tell the people of Israel, pack your bags, we're leaving tonight. Eat fast, slaughter a lamb, roast it, eat the meat quickly, make bread, but do not give it time to rise, unleavened bread. Take the blood of that lamb and with hyssop branches, put it around the doorposts and lentils. Josh has a picture of what that would look like. Take the hyssop branches and, and, and spread the blood of the lamb all around the edges of your doorpost when you, before you walk into your house. Because tonight, the angel of death will pass through the land and will kill the firstborn man, woman, and child of every house that does not have the blood on the door. Moses goes back and warns Pharaoh, but Pharaoh doesn't listen. So that night, the Israelites eat their last meal, their last supper, their last meal. Hello? Last meal. Hello? Their last meal, their last supper as slaves in Egypt. 
All of Egypt was so devastated by all the death of their firstborn that they begged the people of Israel to leave. They begged them to leave. Israel became the people of God that night. So every year on the anniversary of the Passover, when, when the death angel would pass over, that's why they called it Passover, super simple way to remember that story, because the angel of death passed over that night. And so it became a yearly anniversary that they were to reenact the event. Kind of like they would make the unleavened bread, they prepare the lamb, they eat bitter herbs to remind them how bitter it was to be a slave in Egypt. And they were to do this every year so that every generation down through the years would remember what God had done for them. Almost 1,200 years later when Jesus comes and he celebrates his meal with his disciples, they are doing exactly what God wanted them to do, which was to remember the freedom that God had given them. The entire message of Passover is all about going from slavery to freedom. Now, the Apostle Paul calls Jesus our Passover lamb. And we need to understand that the Passover lamb was not a sacrifice just for sin. It was to remember the deliverance and freedom God gave his people. For, for Jews, it was like putting on a play. It's kind of like how we do Christmas plays through, every year to remind us of, that God gave us Christ in the form of a baby. The Jews remembered Passover where God brought them from slavery in Egypt into freedom. So Jesus was kind of taking the, turning the Passover into the Last Supper for us to remember that we have been given, given freedom from sin through Him. So let's think about that night. What did, the, what did the disciples need to be freed from? What is it that we need to be freed from that enslaves us today? What are you enslaved by that you need freedom from? So... so to see this, we have to look back at what's happening around the table that night. Jesus comes to the table that night with a very heavy heart. He knows that in a few hours he's going to be betrayed, arrested, des deserted by all of the disciples, put on trial, beaten, crucified, and die. And the disciples do not get it at all. They have no clue what stands before them. Guess what they're talking about around the table? You know, I alluded to this last week a little bit, they're debating about who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Luke twenty two twenty four tells us, they began to argue amongst themselves at the table that night. I mean, it's even said in Mark that they were, they were arguing to a point that they were getting ready to fight with one another at the table that night. Can you believe it? I mean, Jesus is getting ready to die and they're arguing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. You know, every time I start to feel bad about my Christian walk, uh, I look at the Gospels and I see the disciples being selfish and focusing on themselves, and it just makes me feel so much better for just a minute uh, about myself. And at least I wouldn't be sitting around the table that night that Jesus is going to die. I wouldn't be sitting around the table arguing about who's the greatest, who's the best. Or would I? You ever gotten a group of pastors together? <laughs> they, st they begin to start talking about the, how big their churches are, what new project, project they're doing in their churches, how their churches are growing, how they've turned around Sunday school to start. Man, people are coming to our, our Sunday school classes, and we've done this and that. How attendance is going. How, how, what do you do to get people to come to church? That kind of thing. That's the first thing we see tonight around the table. We're all like that. We're enslaved by pride. Always worried about what other people think about us. Always worried about how we get to the next step and, and go forward to make ourselves look better and everybody else look bad. How we can get ahead while everybody else falls behind. The second thing we see is another type of enslavement that night that one of the disciples uh, didn't really enter into the conversation at all. And when he walked into the room that night, he seemed a little nervous, uh, kind of a little off that night. A little bit on edge. And that's because just a few hours before, 
Judas had gone before the priest, the chief priest, and religious leaders, and, he, and this is what he asked them. How much will you pay me to turn him over to you at a time and place where there are no crowds? How much will you pay me? And so in today's money, you can average it out to be about $10,000. $10,000. Done. I will turn him over to you at a place where there are no crowds, no miracles happening, no feeding of thousands, none of those things, nobody being brought back from the dead, no roaring crowd. I will give him to you for $10,000. And we know that after supper in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas would betray Jesus with a kiss. But why? Why would, why would he do that to Jesus? It's a huge question that has been debated by, by so many people why Judas would do this. Some think he was trying to put Jesus, Jesus in a situation where he would have to stand up and be the king that everybody thought he was going to be. But I don't think that was it. Here's what I think. Judas was a zealot. Um, one who thought the Romans needed to be thrown out of the land of Israel and that Israel needed to, to be the way it was back when David, the, the conquering warrior, and Solomon would just go in and take out any enemy that they had. And he saw Jesus, the way he worked with the crowds, and the huge groups that would come to see Jesus. It got Judas's attention. And so for the first year, Judas gave up everything to follow Jesus. Remember, Jesus goes to the brothers that were fishermen and says, come and follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. They leave their nets behind, leave their parents, leave their father Leave the entire business. And Judas did the same thing. He left everything behind to follow Jesus. So that first year, he gave up everything. And he could tell that Jesus wasn't being aggressive in building his, up his kingdom. And he thought that maybe you know, he's just starting out slow, kind of getting into the foundation to make his, to make his, his foundation of this kingdom. But by the second year... Judas becomes confused because Jesus isn't talking about slitting the throat of the Romans. He's saying stuff like this. If a Roman soldier tells you to carry their bag, you don't carry it for just one mile. You take it for two miles. Jesus is saying stuff like if, if you get struck on the cheek, you turn the other cheek. You love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who do wrong to you. And Jesus, Judas becomes confused. And so as Jesus is coming up to the time of his death, he's talking about how that those who follow him are going to face persecution and even death like him. Jesus is even saying things like, you must take up your cross and follow me. And so for Judas... Judas would say something like, I'm not going to die with this man. I'm, I'm not going to face persecution with him. I didn't sign on for all this. So Judas tries to figure out a way how he's going to make up for the last three years of his life with no income and no nothing. Well, he's already been stealing money out of the treasury. How can I do this and make up for all of those years that I wasted? $10,000 isn't everything, isn't a lot. But at least it's something. I thought about it. What would you do for $10,000? What would you compromise? What, would you compromise what you believe in for $10,000? You have Judas who politically grew up hating the Roman government and Jesus who is teaching love transforms everything. Most of you know that I have very strong political viewpoints and um, very, very strong political viewpoints at times. Sometimes I put my foot in my mouth um, with those political viewpoints. And sometimes we want Jesus to fit into our political viewpoint. Sometimes we want Jesus to fit into what we believe should happen in America. But I, I know this about Jesus. He was not a Democrat. He was not a Republican. He wasn't a Libertarian. 
He didn't fit into any of those molds, but there are pieces of each of them that he does, his character does fit into, and in, in his ethics. But I want to ask you this, when there's a conflict between what Jesus is, what, what you believe as a Christian, and your political viewpoint, what will we do? Judas picked politics. Judas also had a problem with money. In John's gospel, we, in the beginning, when the last, the last meal that he attended before, he had, the lady had poured out all of this perfume on Jesus' feet, and Judas says, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? He didn't care about the poor. He was going to put that money into the disciples' pocketbook, and that meant his pocketbook. The fact that Judas would turn on Jesus for the money also tells us that money was very important to Judas. He couldn't get enough to satisfy himself. Greed became his God. Now, I know none of us deal with that kind of issue, right? What is it that is important to you? What is it that makes you question your morals? What is it that, that you would give up Jesus for? Jesus comes to us to offer us freedom, and he shows us in two different ways that night at the Last Supper. The first way we looked at last week, the disciples who are arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't tell them to stop arguing. He doesn't tell them what the kingdom of God is going to look like. All he does is gets up, goes over, gets the bowl, gets the pitcher with the water, and comes and he washes the disciples' feet. They know exactly what he's going to do as soon as he gets up and walks over to the door. They know exactly what's going to happen. And I guarantee you, all you could hear were breathing. That's all you could hear in the room that night. As Jesus walks towards each one of them and gets down and washes their feet. And he says to them, Do you, do you not understand what I've done for you? I, I've spent the last three years with you. And still you don't get it. I have taught you that true greatness is found in serving, not being served. True greatness is found in not pushing others down as you walk over them. I've, I've taught you that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Don't take the best seat in the room. Be humble. Give. Forgive. Love. Serve. Humble yourself. Serve others. Do you not get it? True freedom is found in not showing others that you're better than they are and convincing them that you're really something and they're nothing. True freedom is about blessing, not being blessed. It's about serving, not being served. It's about giving, not receiving. And that is when you find yourself truly free. So let me ask you this. How do you deal with someone who's, who betrays you? Now, I told you last week, how I deal with people that betray me and stab me in the back. I give them the cold shoulder. Very biblical to give someone the cold shoulder. How do you treat somebody who's done you wrong? How do you treat someone who has betrayed you, has stabbed you in the back? As a youth pastor, I had some of my students that would come to me after school because we, we met right at, like almost right after school. They would come, some of them would come and eat pizza and do their homework. And some of my students in, that had come from school, they would say, my best friend stabbed me in the back, and I will never, ever, ever, ever be their friend, be a friend to that person again. How do you deal with people when someone stabs you in the back? Here's how Jesus dealt with someone betraying him. So let me set it up for you. Usually we think of the Last Supper seen through the way that Leonardo da Vinci painted the painting of the Last Supper. Josh, you have that picture? This is how we usually think of the Last Supper. Um, that's John beside Jesus, not Mary Magdalene, I, I just tell you that. Um, there's a lot of things that are... Um, everything is wrong about this picture, by the way. Um, let me just tell you. Uh, it was not at night, or it was at night, it was not during the day, and you can see that it's painted that it's in the day. There was unleavened bread, and, and he paints it as these French loaves, these long French loaves, 
And it was not up high. The table was not up high. It was down low like this. Um, and there was, I mean, it, just, the, just the heads up. Uh, the one on Jesus' side, that's John. The one with the, the, the young looking one. I think it's on his left on the picture. Yeah, left for you. But there's a lot of things that are wrong with this. But it's not set up like this one long table. It's set up like the triclinium that you see here. Josh, can you go to the picture with the numbers on it? This is how it would be as you're looking at this table. This is kind of how it would be set up. Um, Jesus was the host that evening. Jesus was the host at the meal that night. And he would have sat in position one. Okay? Position one at the table. Positions two and three were for those that were closest to Jesus. The guest of honor or those that were very important to him. Position two would have been for the lesser important of those two because you had to serve the host. Position three would have been the most important person at the table that night because the host would serve you. If it was a family, the younger son would sit in position two. The older son would sit in position three. But when you read John's account of the story, John, you have to read between the lines of how John says this. Jesus is sitting in position one as the host of the meal. And during the meal, he says, one of you will betray me. Peter, probably sitting on the other side of the table, probably position nine, Peter, sitting across the table, he hears Jesus say, one of you is going to betray me. And so what he does is he, he whispers over to John. Because John would be sitting in position three. He's close to Jesus, but he's not the most important person at the table that night. He whispers over to John and he says, hey John, ask him, ask him who it is. Ask him who's going to betray him. And John tells us, the disciple that Jesus loved laid back and leaned on Jesus' chest, on his shoulder. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, it is the one who I serve, the one I give the bread to. In fact, he says, it's the one that I dip the, the sop. Those are the actual words he uses. So who's Jesus going to serve? Jesus is going to serve the person in position three. The one, who's, the one who is a guest of honor. That's the person that is that's looked at as the highest person at the table that night. Now I want you to understand something because a lot of us don't get this in the culture of the Jewish people. To allow someone to dip their bread into your wine or your sauce was a sign of affection. A sign that you loved that person. But to dip it for that person and feed them was an even greater symbol of love. It was a love that was unconditional. It was like, I love, it was announcing to everyone at the table, this person I, I would die for. Jesus is going to dip the sop and give it to the person in the place of the highest honor, the person he chooses to sit at the place of highest honor that night. And who would that be? Judas Iscariot. So how do you deal with your enemy? How do you deal with the people that have betrayed you? How do you treat the people that have done you wrong? How do you deal with people that are opposite politically of your, in your opinion? How do you deal with people that hate you? How do you treat people that are diametrically opposed to you? If you're enslaved by sin, you hold on to bitterness, you think about ways to get them back, you attack them mentally in your head. You know, you have those conversations in your mind, well, I'm going to say this to them the next time I, you wait till the next time they come into the room, I'm going to tell them what I think about them, and you have that whole conversation in your head, well, I should have said this. I, I, next time I see them, I'm going to say that, because it was a good one, I really, I should have said that when I... You think about what you will say the next time that they to put them down. 
or how you were going to win the argument. But Jesus didn't do that. He had been teaching his disciples all along to turn the other cheek, to love those who are your enemy, to pray for those who despitefully use you. And only in that way can you transform them. When you have shown them love and mercy when they don't deserve it. But in the process of loving them, you find yourself free. How many times have we lived with anger and resentment towards someone that didn't even know it? (laughs) But it's us that has that, just that churning inside of us for anger and resentment that we hold on to. And those people never had a clue that there was anything there. And it enslaves us. What do you think Judas was feeling that night? When, G- when he walks into the room that night, and Jesus, being the host, walks over and puts him up at the, be- the head of the table, at the place where the most honored, most loved guest would be. What do you think Judas was feeling in that moment? And now we know why Judas goes back with the money in the bag and he throws it back to them. He says, I, don't, I, can't do, I cannot betray innocent blood. I cannot do this. Just a few months before his death, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he spoke these words on a Christmas Eve sermon that he preached. He says, Do to us what you will. And we will still love you. Throw us in jail and we will still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children. And as difficult as it is, we will still love you. But be assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And one day, we will win our freedom. We will not only win freedom for ourselves, but we will so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. What does this mean for us? How does this intersect with our lives, April of of 2021? What does this look like for you today? What about this week? How can you love others that hate you? How can you serve those who oppose you? How can you honor those who mistreat you? One of the hardest prayers to pray is a pray, to pray a prayer of blessing over those who have mistreated you. That's one of the hardest prayers to pray. Somebody who has used you, somebody has mistreated you, someone has talked bad about you, talked down to you. One of the hardest prayers to pray. And it was prayed by a man that hung on a cross. Father, forgive them. I think if Jesus hung on a cross, had brutally been beaten and tortured, nailed to the cross, but that his prayer for them was, Father, forgive them. In his last moments, Jesus gives us the perfect example of love, forgiveness, and freedom.